Hello! How exactly human evolution unfolded is still unknown. What prompted our ancestors to invent tools, language, and art? Dramatic changes in the climate? Or rather, effective actions of the strongest and the fittest? Or perhaps it was those specimens that were not supposed to survive due to their congenital disorders that became the inventors who used their intelligence more and thus propelled the progress. <gasps> a pack of monkeys is summoned for a meeting at the ancestral tree. A witch begins the ritual dance to greet King Simeon. Today is a special day. The queen is giving birth to her husband's heir. But the counselor, Vladimir, who delivered the baby, is not yet ready to show the children to the tribe. He reports to Simeon that two heirs have been born. But there is a small problem. He invites the king to the chambers, where he discovers a healthy and strong son. The father names him Vanya. The boy turns out to be just like his father. And the first thing he does is hit Simeon on the nose. However, Vladimir informs the king that the boy was born born second and has an older brother, who happens to be much smaller and has almost no body hair. For the tribe to survive, the heir must be strong, and this one is unlikely to be able to even take care of himself. Cette créature n'est pas comme nous. C'est une erreur de la nature. Il ne survivra pas. The witch advises to get rid of the weakling as soon as possible, and the king orders Vladimir to throw it to the predators. The advisor departs to fulfill the task, driving away the witch, who is too eager to kill the child with her own hands. Simeon is left alone with his wife. She asks where her second child is, and is told that he did not survive. Saddened by the loss, the female draws her last breath and passes away. Meanwhile, Vladimir climbs onto the edge of a branch and summons a saber-toothed wolf under the tree. He tries to drop the baby directly into its maw, but the baby clings to his finger and reaches for the counselor. This melts Vladimir's heart, and he is about to change his mind, but the menacing growl of the king, who has just lost his wife, reminds him of his assignment. The baby flies down, and this is where his tiny body becomes an advantage. Even the ordinary leaves soften his freefall, and then he gets tangled in a liana and dangles on it like a bungee cord. At the last moment, the prey escapes from the wolf, but the predator quickly grabs a vine to get closer to the monkey, not realizing the danger he is in. The baby cheerfully stretches his arms forward again, and the predator clamps his right hand between his teeth. The monkey screams in pain. The wolf can't hold on and flies down, losing one of its fangs. At this moment, Vanya is shown to the tribe, and the monkeys happily greet the heir with a dance. Meanwhile, a large but rather dim-witted male named Jan finds his brother on a vine and helps him free himself. He amuses the baby by sneezing loudly with his big nose and blowing bubbles of saliva. Jan is about to go on about his business, but notices that the little monkey can't even move on his own because of an injured arm. The baby cries and persistently asks him to take him along. The big ape can't resist the boy's charm and becomes his guardian. He calls the foundling, Edouard. Years later, the now older boy's right arm still dangles helplessly at the side of his body, and Jan continues to carry him on his back. They arrive at their shelter on the trunk of a broken tree, where they live together with their pet bird. A hungry Edouard tries to find his stash of fruit, but it turns out to be empty. The brisk and sharp-tongued teenager accuses the unvocal and slow Jan of eating everything again, but the real thief turns out to be a small rodent who tries to get away with the loot. Edouard wants to catch the insolent animal, but his disability does not allow him to properly grab the branches. The monkey falls and lands on his back, and a bird's nest catches his eye. Edouard's brain starts working rapidly, and he devises a way to set a trap. He gives Jan three sticks, one of which ends up in his mouth. The monkey blows tree resin out of the hollow stem, creating a huge bubble. The sticky substance comes in handy in building traps, but at this moment their activities are interrupted by the sound of a horn, which announces the start of a game of cocoa ball, which Edwa loves a lot. Jan is afraid to go to the match. The friends live apart from the other monkeys because they get bullied for being different. Edouard notes that his companion is much larger than the bullies and can easily beat them up in a fight. Or alternatively, he can simply let out a roar and all of them will scatter out of fear. <laughs> the kind-hearted Jan is completely unable to terrify his enemies and ties himself to a tree with a rope in protest. To get to the final game, Edouard has no other choice but to threaten him with jumping down from the edge of a branch. To keep his friend from smashing, Jan is forced to catch him midair. They reach the arena, where they take a seat on a branch. 
The monkeys hanging from the vines try to throw a coconut into the mouth of a huge skull faster than the others. The star of the championship, the king's son Vanya, scores a goal in a beautiful jump. Simeon is very pleased with his heir, and the fans scream at the sight of their idol. The second round begins, and Vanya roughly knocks down his opponent, which angers his father. The ball flies high up, and Jan, who is incapable of understanding all the rules, rushes after it. Edwa tries to hold him back, but they both end up falling right into the center of the arena. The coconut gets lost, and the monkeys start blaming the two chumps for ruining the match. Edwa is rudely shoved away as he tries to make excuses for his unintelligent friend. He then advises Jan to use the intimidation technique they practiced earlier. The flimsy attempt doesn't impress anyone, but the monkeys pick up on the intent to fight. They start to surround Jan, while Edwa finds the ball that has rolled into a crevice. Using a stick and tar, he picks it up and walks out to the crowd. The less savvy monkeys are impressed with the device he has invented, and Vanya approaches to retrieve the ball. Edwa hopes to somehow participate in the matches, and suggests that they hang another skull to make it a team game. While they talk, the witch and Vladimir notice a short toe on the foot of the intelligent stranger, and realize that he is the king's son. Vanya has no intention of changing the rules, and tries to start the match by launching the coconut upwards, but his hand sticks to it, and the other monkeys try to help him get it off. Everyone pulls in different directions, and the coconut flies upward, landing right on Simeon's head. Vladimir snatches off the stuck ball along with a clump of the king's hair. Now Simeon has a huge bald spot on the top of his head, which he demands to be covered with someone else's fur. Since no one wants to volunteer, it is decided that the inventor of the glue should give his own hair. The king demands to know his name and bring the boy to him. Later, Vladimir comes to the witch to figure out how to solve the problem. He shakes with fear at the sight of skulls and bones in her dwelling and assures her that he threw the baby to the predator. He has no idea how the child managed to survive, and the dark ape chases the counselor away, showering him with curses. Suddenly, Vanya, who overheard the conversation, appears out of the darkness. The witch reveals the truth to him. Mais lui qui doit oh, she dodges to avoid getting hit during the boy's fit of anger, and afterward offers her help. When Vanya leaves, the monkey uses magic to attract grasshoppers, which she intends to use to get rid of Edwa once and for all. Meanwhile, Jan and his friend return home. Edwa suffers from loneliness and tries to convince his friend to move closer to the tribe so that they can socialize more with the other apes. Jan flatly refuses. He is perfectly happy living as an outcast. He suggests that Edwa go alone, but the latter does not want to leave his friend. Besides, he can't imagine his life without his right hand. This time, Jan protests by turning his bottom to towards Edwa's face. This is when they are noticed by two monkeys sent by Vladimir. Vladimir's balding brother, Sergei, and a goofy large guy named Marcel. While Jan hides in fear, Edwa, along with his possessions, is kidnapped and brought to the pack. He is taken to Simeon, who blames the inventor for his sudden baldness. The resourceful Edwa, with just one hand, crafts a crown from leaves and twigs to cover his father's baldness. The subjects gasp at Simeon's majestic appearance, and he himself becomes very pleased. The only people who are not happy about this development are Vanya and the witch. While Edwa is looking for new ways to impress the king, the monkey leaves to find a way to eliminate him. Using water and a large lily, Edwa creates a mirror and shows Simeon his reflection. At first, Frightened of his rival, the king jumps away, but then begins to look at his reflection with interest. Edwa then creates a throne made of vines and huge leaves, and now the king can comfortably watch the distant borders of his kingdom. But his delight is interrupted by a swarm of locusts sent by the witch. In the commotion, the vines of the throne burst, and Simeon falls down from a great height. The witch screams that Edwa has killed the king and demands that he be punished. Vanya grabs his brother by the neck and throws him down the cliff. Jan watches in horror as Edwa falls to the ground, but Simeon himself turns out to be alive and climbs back up to the tribe. He is unhappy that the inventor has been unjustly punished. Aucun Simeon ne tue un autre Simeon. Enraged, the king turns to Vladimir, who has failed in his task, but the problem has solved itself. Edwa is lying unconscious on the ground, and the predators are about to devour him. Jan comes down to Liana trying to help, but can't reach his friend. The awakened Edwa is feeling dizzy and can't climb up the tree with only one arm. Instead, he heads straight for the savanna, where he won't have to use his forelimbs to get around. However, things aren't so easy here either, as the flat ground is full of pits that are easy to fall into, should you lose your footing. After getting out of trouble, Edwa meets two giant ostriches. He wants to reach for the bunch of grapes in the mouth of one of them, and in the process straightens up to his full height. 
This is how the monkey has learned to stand on two legs and is delighted about the discovery. But then, a pack of wolves appears. The ostriches start running away. Edwa also tries to escape by running on his two legs, but so far he is only able to do it in reverse. The monkeys notice the survived inventor trying to save himself again. They cheer him on, and someone even offers to place bets. Having noticed the ostrich's running technique, Edwa realizes how to shift the gearbox and steers himself forward. With his straight legs, the guy proves to be extremely agile, and the wolves can't catch up with him. For the first time in his life, his non-functioning arm is not a hindrance to him. The ostriches try to evade the chase by zigzagging through a herd of rhinos, and Edwa follows them. The huge animals also get spooked by the predators and start running away, heading straight for the ape tree. The rhinos turn out to be the ancestors of armadillos and curl up in a ball before colliding with the tribe's home. Simeon must stand alone in defense of both the pack and Edwa, who helplessly awaits his fate. The king leaps down and bravely deflects the attack, throwing several rhinos aside. But his strength proves insufficient, and the herd knocks him down. The tree shudders from the impact, but it manages to endure it, unlike Simeon. The last thing he does is shielding his son with his body. He is mortally wounded. With his last breath, he apologizes to Edwa for wanting to get rid of him and calls him his heir. Accustomed to being an outcast, the boy cannot yet comprehend the full gravity of this revelation, and Vanya takes advantage of the hesitation to take his father's body. He warns the frail brother to not even think about laying claim to his kingdom. Edwa is left standing next to a crown of leaves, lying on the ground. On the tree, the witch is ready to introduce the new king to the tribe. Vladimir showers the prince with compliments but this does not help him to retain his honorable status of advisor, and Vanya replaces him with his brother, Sergei. The new king goes out to the tribe and is offered to choose his wife. Instead, Vanya climbs onto a podium created from the other monkeys. He bangs his fist imperiously and declares that he will keep their way of life unchanged and will follow the traditions, as his father did. The crowd applauds, and the witch suggests that Vanya perform one of those ancient traditions and eat his father. The son is about to start eating his father when Edwa interrupts him. He has no intention of fighting for the throne and only hands his brother the lost crown, which Vanya places on Simeon's lifeless body. Edwa asks why such traditions exist and suggests burying the king instead. The witch replies that this is the only way the wisdom of the father will be passed to the son, and if the ritual is broken, the irreparable will happen. Edwa scoffs at the witch's pompous words, and they get into an argument, telling everyone about his origin. The guy declares a new rule, no more eating their fathers. But Vanya remains resolute, and only a bright lightning and thunderclaps make him stop. In fear, the monkeys hide from the storm, and Edwa is left alone with his father's body. Jan joins his friend, and together they throw Simeon down the tree. The anxious weirdo refuses to climb down the vines, but Edwa manages to persuade him, and afterwards, they cover the king's body with a large flat stone. Suddenly, lightning strikes a small tree nearby, setting it on fire. Edwa is attracted to the flame and tries to grab it. He mistakes the burn for the fire biting him and starts hitting it back with a stick. It catches fire, and the guy ends up with a torch in his hand. However, the flame is immediately extinguished by a downpour, and a huge tornado forms in the desert. The monkeys hide in a tree, sending Vladimir out to die in the open. He is pulled into the vortex with other poor creatures, and Edwa also ends up there. The guy gets thrashed around, and inside the hurricane, he spots a beautiful female trying to hold onto a branch. Edwa almost manages to grab her, but gets thrown out, and the girl flies out after him. She falls on the ledge unconscious, risking falling into the abyss. The boy ties himself to a tree and goes down after her, but the wind lifts them back up into the sky. Still, the enamored Edwa does not let go of the stranger, and Jan helps them escape by grabbing the torn off Liana in time. Even with only one hand, Edwa pulls the female out of the abyss. Once she wakes up, however, she immediately slaps him. The girl speaks a different language, which Edwa mistakes for Portuguese. He realizes that the hurricane has swept her whole family into the abyss and tries to express his sympathy, but the savage only bites him in response and runs away, unwilling to let go. Edwa sets off in pursuit. He has to pass through rhinoceroses that are running like a train at a crossing and jump over a river of lava. As he approaches the volcano, he has to dodge pterodactyls protecting their eggs. Eventually, he catches up with the girl and climbs up the cliff with her, overcoming every obstacle. Edwa falls to the ground exhausted, and then Lucy calmly introduces herself to him in a familiar language. The surprised guy jumps up and starts complaining about how much he had to overcome. 
Why was Lucy running away and pretending not to understand him? But the mysterious girl quickly quells Edwa's discontent by starting to sniff him with interest. Afterward, she learns from him how to walk upright. The coach and his student lie merrily on the ground, watching a picturesque sunset and the monkey's baobab in the distance. They become friends, and Edwa tells the girl about his life and royal lineage. Lucy wonders why the boy lives as an outcast. In the river of lava, Edwa sets a stick on fire again and experiments with the flame. With a torch in hand, he approaches his home baobab, and the monkeys start waking up in a panic. They think the fire has come down from the volcano and is going to destroy them. The witch notices Edwa, and soon the tribe meets the inventor. This time, he proposes to drive away predators with fire, which greatly impresses the audience. Vanya intervenes, trying to drive away the guy with the dangerous toy, trying to please the monkeys even further. Edwa divides the fire and offers everyone to take torches, but the sticks begin to fall, threatening to burn the monkeys home to the ground. The witch orders the uninvited guests to be chased away with sticks and stones. Sergei also takes a liking to Lucy and tries to drag her upstairs. Edwa leaps and burns the kidnapper with a torch, saving his friend. The two of them flee from the frantic crowd. <laughs> the howls of predators in the night signal that it's time to seek shelter. With the most powerful weapon in the savannah, Edwa heads straight for the saber-toothed wolf's cave. He playfully seizes its dwelling, and he and Lucy comfortably settle down under the roof. Forgetting for a moment about the torch, they try to put out the fire like wild animals, not knowing what to do with the flame now. Edwa pulls himself together and stops the panic, and then invents a fire pit, fencing off the danger with stones. Clearly in love, Lucy watches the guy jumping from pain and minor burns. She comes closer, and they invent a kiss. The other monkeys observe the romantic moment and the huge shadow cast by the bonfire. They start repeating after the lovers, and Vanya and the witch again realize the power is slipping from their hands. The tree itself begins to growl loudly, and the king, with a menacing shout, forces the tribe to quiet down. In the morning, Lucy teaches Edwa to throw flat stones in order to knock down high-hanging fruit and hunt animals. The disability again pushes the guy to work smart and effectively using branches as catapults. They learn to make fire by carving sparks with stones, invent spears, and tame a saber-toothed wolf. The whole tribe watches their success with envy from the height of the branches, and the smell of roasted meat finally drives the monkeys wild. The witch again uses the cavity system to produce a terrifying howl, but one of the kids discovers the deception and informs everyone that the tree spirit is a fiction and the higher powers are not angry at the monkeys. The witch is showered with a hail of stones, and the tribe begins to descend to Edwa. Even Sergei and Marcel are about to come down, but the king stops them in time. Only the witch and the female in love with Vanya remain loyal to him. The monkeys join Edwa and Lucy, but the girl is hurt by the hostility they met her with earlier. She chases the guests away, and Edwa, who has waited a long time for his moment of glory, tries to persuade her to let the tribe in. Eager to become their new king and change the monkeys' way of life, he works out a compromise. All the monkeys must work, and then they will be allowed to stay. Although the small cave gets crowded at night, Edwa quickly comes up with ways for them to have fun. His new invention is music, and the monkeys start dancing. Day after day, and week after week, the tribe gets better and better settled on the rocks with Edwa. Vanya continues to languidly rule his empty kingdom. The witch dreams of revenge on the outcast who has seized the reins of power. Soon, Lucy and Edwa start expecting a new addition to the family. The girl refuses to name her son Zinedine Sedan and suggests the name Jan. She wants to thank Edwa's friend for saving her husband many years ago. The monkeys are in the middle of a big construction project, hauling a bunch of logs to build an actual city. Life is booming, and it's no longer just Edwa who is using his wit for the good of the community. <laughs> Although all the monkeys have mastered walking on two legs, their intelligence leaves much to be desired, and a passing couple attacks the drawings of mammoths with stones. After calming them down, Edwa goes farther, where he sees Sergei in an argument with beggars. Just like the construction manager, 
They too have invented a way to not carry heavy logs, but nonetheless have food. Edwa wants to settle the problem like a true king, but Sergei doesn't like being bossed around and grabs him by the throat. Suddenly, a swarm of locusts launched by the witch descends on the city. The insects collapse the buildings and turn them to rubble. Although Edwa tries to calm the monkeys, Sergei leads the tribe to war. Lucy advises Edwa to set off quickly and rescue his brother before the crowd reaches the tree. Riding a wolf, he reaches the baobab first, but Vanya does not respond. The monkeys with torches and spears are ready to cut down the tree, and none of the arguments that they will still need it work. Finally, the king appears from his hiding place. Sergei proposes that he give them the tree, and they let him walk away safely. But Vanya flatly refuses. Je t'en propose un autre. Je te laisse ta vie sauve. Tu me laisses mon bagnon. <laughs> the monkeys start chopping down the baobab roots, and the king fiercely defends his home. He can defeat anyone in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but Sergei hits him with a torch, and Vanya screams in pain. He knocks the weapon out of the attacker's hands, and the fire spreads to the vines, and then to the tree itself. As the king tries to fight off the crowd, his wife gets surrounded on all sides by flames. Edwa hooks himself to a liana and ties the other end to the wolf, forcing it to run in the opposite direction of the tree. The guy hoists himself up and rescues the female. The tree can no longer be saved, but he wants to at least help Vanya, who is being battered with sticks. But suddenly, a flaming branch of the tree comes crashing down and crushes Edwa. He begs for help, but the tribe panics and flees away from the baobab. Vanya is the last to get up, and after all, carries his brother away from the tree, which explodes, taking the witch to the afterlife. The brothers do not look back at the explosion, barely escaping the catastrophe. Later, they examine the ashes that remain of their home. Edwa apologizes for what happened, but Vanya takes the blame. In response to the question of how he will move on with his life, the powerful ape awkwardly tries to stand on two legs. Vanya is ready to rethink his beliefs, and the two brothers share their first warm hug. Their wives greet them to the lamentations of the monkeys who have just come to their senses, realizing that they now have nowhere to get wood. They celebrate that Simeon's heirs have made peace, but Sergei starts causing panic by pointing out that they no longer have food either. Edwa sees birds flying south and wants to suggest that they go on a journey. Nobody hears him in the clamor, so Vanya helps to get everyone's attention with an intimidating cry. Together, they call for order, and the monkeys turn into nomads. They leave their homes with nothing to keep them there, and find forests, rivers, and mountains full of resources. Mes chéris, voilà notre nouveau monde. Here, they discover Jan, who was somehow the first to arrive in these lands. The weird fella is overjoyed, and tosses his old friend up in the air. The movie's peculiar humor, with its specific French references, can be hard to grasp for foreign viewers, with some things being lost in translation. The somewhat outdated animation style didn't help its case either, and the cartoon was not very popular outside of its native France. The appearance of the characters Vladimir and Sergei were based on the legendary French comedian Louis de Funès, who has greatly influenced the director and the performer of the main role, Jamel Debbouze, Louis' son, Olivier participated in the creation of these characters and their dialogues. In French, the cartoon is called Why I Did Not Eat My Father. This is the directorial debut of Debouze, who is also known for his role as Numerobus in Asterix and Obelix. He also voiced and gave his appearance to the cartoon's main character, Edwa. When he was 14 years old, Debouze suffered a serious injury to his right arm. He and his friend were rushing to catch a bus, ran across the tracks at a railway station, and did not notice an approaching train. A reference to this episode also appears in the cartoon, when Edwa rushes to Lucy and waits for the rhinos to pass in front of him. As always, look for the title of the movie in the video description. In the meantime, let us know in the comments. Do you have any weaknesses that you've used to your advantage? And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give this video a like so that more awesome stories come out as often as possible.